famous Frank Henschker. And uh, uh, believe it or not, we are through another week of uh, Siegel Talks in the middle of June. And it's another day on planet Earth, a very beautiful one here in New York City. It's nice and warm and sunny. And uh, it seems like the city is breathing uh, uh, a big uh, sight of relief and um, and so still people are wearing masks and the news from India and the news from UK and now also from uh, from other countries about the new bar and is still in the back of people's mind but we try um, to ignore it even so the German um, health ministry said here people should put their masks back on because they do not really know how it will affect all those who are not fully vaccinated. Um, Still, uh, uh, we are hoping that we will see more theater in this uh, uh, fall and that theater will reopen and performance uh, will uh, be taking place. But big question, and this is the one we examined over this entire year and this time of Corona is really what is of significance? What is urgent? What matters? What shall we do in a time where potentially our lives were at risk and uh, in danger, and uh, and as we talked uh, some time ago, also with Gerald Thomas, you know, who quoted back at and to say, you know, what is we all going to die? This is clear, but what is it worth to do in the time we are alive? And we, of course, think theater and the arts is the closest uh, to also experience life and to share and to be in a community and also to ask questions and um, maybe have better questions afterwards. One of the artists in New York City who I feel has always asked those questions, whether it's through pandemic or not, or in a way, there was always an urgency to her work as if there was a pandemic and she had to stay, make a statement. It's Sybil Kempson um, who is here with us. Um, Sybil, thank you, thank you, thank you. Greg, thank uh, you. Uh, to, uh, and to, thanks for doing these. These have been so meaningful and helpful to all of us. And you've just done it with so much passion and determination this whole time since the beginning. And it's an amazing way to track through our whole experience globally as we go through this. Wow. So you're listening to some episodes? I didn't yeah. know. Yeah. 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 And they're really great for students too. I think, you know, uh -huh. seeing how, what, what is everybody thinking about? How is everybody handled? I haven't listened to all of them, but as many as, as uh, nobody I did. So uh, that's impossible. We have over 150 now. We're slowly, I think, coming to an end by the end of June um, of the Seagull House focus on the time of Corona in this different way. Um, we will continue. We discovered this. All our programs were uh, shut down at CUNY, our little small black or brown box theater. You know, we couldn't get into it. Everything got canceled, but I felt um, we have to do something. And this emerged and it seems to be working and also right. created and helped to create some meaning. Sybil, um, to um, let our audience know a little bit more as an artist who uh, did something what a lot of people, a lot of artists also talked about, like going perhaps out that the metropolis is being in a different community, being in contact with nature, being outside of um, um, the, uh, the, the traditional hunting grounds and uh, gathering grounds for artists, which are uh, in the US also, you know, big cities like, uh, like uh, uh, New York or you know, Los Angeles or, or, or many, many other towns that are now emerging like Austin or Chicago, Detroit, and Philadelphia. Um, she moved upstate New York. Um, but let me tell you all a little bit about her. Um, Sybil began making performance at the Little Theater and at the Great Dixon Place at the turn of the millennium. Yes, it's true. It's uh, some time ago already, and uh, but also not so long. She launched her company, The Seven Daughters of Eve, theater performance company in 2015. Actually, also we were a bit involved um, and, and with this and the name of the new religion they are starting a spiritual movement and to me you'll tell us a little bit more is called femme animism um, their latest work made during the 2020-21 global pandemic uh, will uh, premiere at Abrams Art Center and the Chocolate Factory and uh, actually Brian will be with us next week also uh, with Alex from from the Jack Art Center to get an in, in view also um, about um, what's going on in New York. Other artists will be uh, the Pina Bausch company from, uh, from Wuppertal will tell how they got through the, the pandemic. Also, not so long after the great Pina Bausch left us and how did they deal with this absence and death and change and uh, preparing for, for, for time that come later. And then we're going to hear from the great festival in Barcelona um, next week. But um, she, uh, Sybil, to get back to her, she creates radio plays, video installations, 
video collage, theoretical mini series, project installations, live concert performance, and at the NYU's Kerbal will come up in the fall. Um, so you can um, visit her work at the uh, sevendaughtersofeve.com. She has been also at the Siegel. She did most beautiful work also with the big dance, uh, the ones um, I saw. And, um, and also she did work at the Whitney. She created a, a performance ritual celebrating um, um, uh, uh, the change of seasons and time. So she has already been working very much in what truly can be called an experimental theater, a theater that tries to extend boundaries, to examine what we can do, what is not be done, but should be done. And um, we are lucky that she was with us. Uh, Sybil said, Frank, I'm not sure if this is the right time. I'm in the middle of my <laughs> fights. I'm in the trenches. Call me someone said that I said, no, this is more interesting to hear from you, or as interesting, but maybe more urgent now, um, you know, while you are, um, um, in a way, if I say the right word, struggling or trying to make sense. So um, normally I say, where are you and what time is it? But still, where are you in time? So it must be the same. Well, I'm, um, I'm in Newburgh, New York. That's where I've been living uh, mostly since, I don't know, 2017. I fled the city. I just couldn't afford to live there and have, you know, like a, like a human, <laughs> like a human life anymore. And so I came up here uh, and, and I, I've been here on and off. So I'm in the home of a friend who uh, is working overseas, who's been over in Sweden for um, uh, quite, quite, quite a, quite a ways since the pandemic started. And I'm, all my stuff is in storage, um, but, uh, we're both, if you're in New York City or New Jersey, we're both in um, Lenape Hoking, the Lenape land where I also yes. grew up. I've spent most of my life on this land. So I'm always, uh, I think it's a magical place and really important and special. So I'm here. Uh, in, in so is it close to the Hudson or where is it located? Yeah, it's What's the close? Hudson River Valley and it's right across the river from uh, Beacon, New York. So where the, if oh. anybody goes to the Dia Beacon, uh, where the town mm -hmm. Over the bridge. Over the big bridge, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a, a great, great place. So how was that time for you, that time of Corona? Oh, well, um, it's funny when you were, when you were talking at the beginning, uh, it was like, I felt like I'd been getting ready for it for a while. I didn't, uh, I, I didn't know how far it was gonna go, you know? Um, I remember also, uh, when September 11th happened thinking, okay, you know, is this gonna go on all day or, you know, what all is going to happen? And so I sort of went into like prepper mode a little bit. And I, and I, um, I fled uh, Newburgh. I had an apartment here at the time. And I had a friend who was another friend, <laughs> just living mm -hmm. in friends' houses who another lady artist friend who is stuck in Marfa. And so she has a, 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 an old farmhouse that she's renovating in the Catskills. And so I went up there and stayed for three months while she was trapped in the museum at Marfa. And um, it was really kind of in the middle of nowhere. And um, I felt, I it was like an immediate adjustment. It was very strange feeling like I, um, mentally and emotionally, I adjusted kind of immediately to the situation. And it was really stressful and painful and um, kind of heart-wrenching because the, uh, the reality of species extinction that we were facing and I think still are facing was very real. Uh, and at the same time, it was uh, really, really meaningful. Like any work that I make now is gonna be mark real mark making if it, if it wasn't already uh it, it really is now and so i went up there and i was able to continue teaching and making and finding new ways of making which i already was sort of searching for because i moved out of the city and it was becoming increasingly difficult to sort of do the commute even though it's possible but it was really exhausting uh so i just started uh doing everything on zoom and on video and i'm still uh, work in that way. And uh, I had, um, I had a, a, a project in the works for eight years now. 
um, this project about Mary Shelley that I started working on in Austin and Minneapolis during a couple of different residencies in uh, 2013. And uh, it's with Graham Reynolds, a composer from mm -hmm. Austin. And uh, so I finally finished it and uh, I was supposed to uh, put it on at, um, at Abrams Art Center at the Playhouse with, um, with um, uh, Chocolate Factory Theater also with Brian. And um, I just figured, well, that's, that's all off. Everything's crashing and burning. That's, that's all off. But then they got in touch with me and said, do you want to still do something? We have a little bit, we don't have the budget that we had planned to have, but we have something. I said, yes. And so uh, we, we came together uh, with a reduced cast um, and worked remotely uh, with Chris Giarmo, who's in New Orleans and Dee Beesnell, who's in Brooklyn and Brian Mendez, who's across the mm -hmm. river in Beacon. And uh, we just sort of came together and uh, also with, with a few collaborators, Ava von Schweinitz, who is in Brooklyn. Um, and, uh, and we just started working on it on Zoom. We recorded everything and Chris edited it together into an audio play. And now the whole time I've been working on visuals. So we've all been doing our green screening shots and collaging and uh, sort of putting everything together with my rudimentary skills on iMovie. And uh, it's been really meaningful and sort of a game changer for me. And another another observation that I made during the, the lockdown was like, this is about as much solitude as I need. I always feel like a lot of my struggle is, you know, theater is very communal and community oriented and group oriented. And I'm also a writer. So I'm always kind of fighting for this uh, alone time. And it, it was this very eerie feeling of this, is, of realizing this is about how much I need. And so really uh, diving all the way into that and, um, I felt a real determination to uh, not waste the time and um, doing a lot of thinking about my company um, when the Black Lives Matter uprising began in May, it, um, it completely changed the way I am looking at my own position as an artist and, and as a person uh, in the world. And so trying to uh, figure out how to go forward as a white artist in this in this time, and uh, how much space uh, do I have the right to take up uh, with my work? And so, um, to that end, I I sort of started to move toward um, just occupying like a small corner uh, on Patreon. And so, folks who are interested can subscribe. And 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 we've been doing performance. Patreon is uh, sorry, I don't know. Uh, Patreon is um. It's a website. It's almost like um, it's almost like a crowdfunding website, but where people contribute on a regular basis, and um, so so they become like subscribers, and then uh, you sort of post any content. So um, I started a, an astrology podcast. I'm not an astrologer, but I work with one very closely uh, in my work and a lot of my work, Omi Johnson. And uh, we work with another astrologer, uh, Satori, out in Seattle. And so we have a bi-weekly podcast about uh, the astrological influences at work at any given time. And then there's another, it's like these levels of subscribership where I post about our process of making and then I started making little episodes of a new play um, on video called The Percipients. It's another play about Sasquatch, who I seem mm -hmm. to write about a lot. Um, and then uh, Omi, the astrologer that I work with, had alerted me to a particular influence um, or a particular aspect of transit that happened. It started in 2011. And it's this uh, very distant, slow moving star called Regulus. And it governs uh, world religions and worship styles. And it moved in 2011 from the sign of Leo to the sign of Virgo. 
Uh, and so uh, it's been in Leo for about 2000 years, about the length of time that, that we've had Christianity. And before that, it was in Cancer for 2000 years, which was, you know, it's like the mother, all of those matriarchal kind of moon, moon honoring religions. And now it's moved into Virgo, which uh, we won't see its full expression in our time, in our lifetime, because it's so slow moving. It takes really 2000 years to express itself, but it's the planet Oh, you're a Virgo, aren't you, Frank? True. Service, How did you know that? Service and um, and study and cleaning up the mess and um, being devoted to something and a sort of a, a selflessness and it, and it's also more of a feminine sign. So, I thought, God, I'm so excited about that. Why not, you know, start a little religion ourselves to sort of get the ball rolling, even though it's just starting. So. Uh, we started having these um, sort of religious services on Zoom uh, last spring. And I had to put all of this on hold so that I could finish this Mary S project, which is all consuming. Um, but, but at least we got it started and, and, and we can go back to it um, when Mary S is, is finished, if not before, hopefully. So it, it sounds like a lot happened um, in, for you yeah. inside your mind, but also yes. in your outside world. Um, as a question, you worked with um, companies we would consider the heavyweights in the field, which is close to us, ERS, uh, Big Dance, uh, with the Root Max, that beautiful play I also saw it in Austin. Um, and, um, and then you said, I also have to create my own company to take ownership of my work. Mm. And, what, and now, you know, you, you move in that field, you did work at the Whitney. Tell us a bit, why, why did you kind of moved away from collaboration? Why did you have your own company? And then ultimately you went away from the city. Tell us a little bit about all these. Well, um, at that time, uh, I, uh, of these collaborations were super, super valuable. Like that was kind of like another like school degree is, is, is working and, 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 and writing for specific performers or specific groups and having sort of a call and response process. Uh, I learned so much and I feel like as a person, I wasn't behaving very well. And I think uh, I, I did a lot of thinking about that, like being in the rehearsal room and just like, just being kind of a control freak. And uh, I talked to a lot of, of close friends about it and was encouraged, like, you should start your own company so that you, so that you don't have to uh, feel like that. And so that, you know, you can set up the collaborations however you need them to be. And also as a way of um, growing up a little bit uh, 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 and um, bolstering the creative process with practical skills and practical concerns and making the budget myself, raising the money. My, I mean, honestly, it was like the last thing I felt like doing. I knew it was going to be a total nightmare and it definitely is, but it definitely, it, it's been necessary for me uh, to kind of put my money where my mouth is. And, um, you know, uh, and I'm still thrilled if somebody wants to do one of my plays, but it's better if they just do it, you know, call me with questions and I'll see you on opening night and, you know, or I'll come and, and, and read it if, if people need to hear how I'm thinking about it. Um, but to just let, be able to let go. And, um, and at the same time to figure out uh, ways of doing leadership that aren't, based on the Roman empire sort of command and control model, that hierarchy that I think theater borrows from a lot of the time when you're in the professional sphere. And that oftentimes just felt like restrictive for me and, and, and unfair in a lot of ways. And so I'm trying to, and I don't have it figured out, but it's, it's uh, working on the pig pile piece that you mentioned in Austin and sort of having a more amoebic form um, uh, was, was really enlightening where mm -hmm. the, uh, it's more confusing, it's more chaotic, 
Uh, but those are na also natural patterns, like the patterns of chaos are, are out of nature. And so how can, how can we work in a way where there's, there's more room for roles to change as, as, as those needs come up or, or as someone becomes inspired or as someone, someone's energy sort of leaves them and someone else needs to come in and, and, um, and pick up the slack. And so we really had a chance to practice that during that Whitney project, which was we were doing basically four full productions a year, one at every solstice and every equinox for four years and doing other shows. <clears throat> Tell us a bit what you did at the Whitney. What, what was your intervention? Oh, well, um, uh, it, was, it was about time and it was about cycles. And as I was getting older, I was noticing the way that um, time seemed to move in a coil as opposed to a line, the way that we think about it. And it had less to do with um, numbers or dates uh, and more to do with the passing of the seasons and how my memory would hang on to experience and, um, and the, the sort of tone of experience would take on the, uh, the qualities of a season and thinking about that building. Cause um, when I first conceived that project, they were just building, the building wasn't open yet. The new downtown Whitney, yeah. Yeah, and so um, talking with uh, Jay Sanders who was the performance curator when it first, when it first started about how to, um, how to sort of bring that consciousness into a place that's in, a, in the middle of, a, of like an urban environment and, and, and uh, what can we observe about the, the, uh, the universe from that, from that place and, and um, the interactions of beauty uh, that are natural in a, in, you know, if you're, if you're like in the city, like you're in the, like you said in the opening, it's a beautiful day in the city right now. And it's like, oh, well, what is beautiful about it? You know, I know here there's a beautiful breeze right now. And the way that the trees are blowing, it's making this beautiful sound. It's like kind of a whispering and there's like a dappled sunlight and it's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's like, just like the perfect temperature. And how all of those qualities sort of blend together and make a very, if we're paying attention, a really meaningful moment. And, and, and then looking at the calendar, if I am going to look at the calendar on Sunday, I think it's Sunday, we have the summer solstice, so it's, the season is about to change. And um, how many seasons and where is the moon? What, is, what are the movements of, of the moon? And like how deeply can we observe these natural patterns and with how much attention and effort can we observe and honor them? Like, what are the ways of honoring them? Uh, Cause normally we don't even, we don't even pay attention. So it was really like a tuning in and um, we would look at the calendar. And so sometimes like the solstice or the equinox would happen at five o'clock in the morning. And so the museum agreed to open up, uh, mm -hmm. open its doors and, and get security staff there. I mean, bless them. We did like a whole ceremony for them at the end because uh, they, mm -hmm. they were showing up at four o'clock if, if, we if we were doing it at four o'clock. And, you know, people, people would set their alarm and, and show up if they managed to wake up for, for a ceremony at 530 in the morning. And we would end it at sunrise or we would start it at sunset and end it at midnight or, you know, however, they, they just took all of these, these different forms according to the yeah. research according to all all the different astrological aspects that's when i really started working with only and you were kind of dressed like in a shamanic way and part of your company you had you know the special well the that was on you had a big following more and more people would come after each event and it became yeah a, a yeah, ritual, I, yeah i should say that it was really goofy also what we did and sort of like um you know, it's a really fancy building. It's a fancy part of town now, you know, like if you go, like I would go into that building and just feel like I don't like what I'm going to get everything dirty. If I walk in here, like, why are they, I can't even believe I'm being allowed in this like beautiful shining building. And so part of our, part of our goal was to change the energy up, you know, and to make it less serious and less imposing and make it a little more like redneck a little bit. Like mm. That's what I kept saying. And so I worked with Suzanne Bocanegra, who's um, an incredible visual artist who also makes performance. And 
Um, I'd worked with her uh, for our inaugural production of Let Us Now Praise Susan Sontag and um, and also for Ich Kürbisgeist, which big which Kürbis was the piece yeah. that um, that Big Dance did. And also Red Eye Theater in Minneapolis did that piece. I'm so happy that they mm. that they did it as well. And so she she made these costumes that were uh, really not thinking in a costume in like a theatrical way at all. It was it was like how much can we pile on this? And uh, she thinks very associatively. And uh, she talk about a mad scientist. I think Suzanne is definitely a mad scientist, and she would just bring whatever she had in her huge pile in her studio, you know, and she would have these miraculous, like, oh, I have five wetsuits, you know, these neoprene wetsuits. I have these weird coral uniforms that I got at a garage sale from an opera company or, you know, something. And then she would make little decorations. And so um, little emblematic um, elements that seemed to stand for something, but we didn't know what. And so mm. we really uh, practiced that where there was a, uh, uh, a working and very specific symbology that was ridiculous and very yeah, no, stupid. It's, true. And it's, it's what kind of uh, what what Philip Glass said once about music. He said, uh, "I don't know what it means, but it's meaningful." You know. Oh. So, and I think um, that was also the case there. And you also, in a way, in your playful way, but also serious way, you know, questions um, we do wrestle with. You know, with climate change, the our con our connection to nature really and to our lives, you know, the cycles we go through, something has been lost. And this is something we, everybody talked also about in this time of course, the artists, they're very much concerned. It's also Bruno Latour and Frédéric Aitui in different ways, you know, who uh, say we have to find a way for ourselves as artists, but also for audiences and for theater as a symbolic, imaginary, but real space to point to what's missing. And I think uh, so many people experience now cooking or gardening plants. So this is a moment of change. I think you were in the way of the avant-garde pointing to that you were a step ahead, avant-garde, you know, one, the ones who get shot first in a way, uh, uh, if you are, uh, that it, this is a military term, so you are right. Even the avant-garde uh, in theater is a Roman empire military term. Yeah. And, um, and uh, yeah, but, you, how how is how do you think about writing now? As many say now, it was a time of writing. Uh -huh. Kirby's guys, you invented that fantastic language. You know, I always felt your work was resisting the commercial theater, but also what's resisting the kind of downtown theater, which the kind of easy, you know, fr fret company like you know, like let's all just do something and it will be great. You had a resistance. It was not easy. You intentionally. Uh, made it a uh, complex, uh, mysterious. So, so you wrote, uh, I remember that was so beautiful, that great performance, um, you know, that that new language that was used then by the actor. So uh, what happened? It was about language in that time. Do, do you think about it uh, next to the, all the visual and performance uh, uh, work you do now and the rituals? Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think it's changing a little bit. I'm thinking about the written word as... Um, not taking like uh is it time for it to take less priority or connect it more to the body or uh to the land and landscape which i think that's what i was doing in kerbis guys i was on tour a lot as a performer and we were going to all these different countries where uh they spoke other lang languages than english and so uh i really loved learning a little bit of each language and sort of tracing the way that it uh, revealed, like the structure of a language reveals the thought structures of the people who are speaking it also. And even, even when, when we learn another language, and we go back and forth, there's a different mode of thought that we take on and our thought structures are, are different. And, and, and that happens uh, for me also if I, if I change landscape. Uh, and I do really believe strongly that language is connected to landscape and ways of speaking, um, dialects even of, of, of English in the United States change as we move through the United States. And, and as the land forms change and as relationship to land changes. And so uh, that piece was sort of a, an observation of, of that phenomenon, I guess, that 
I feel like is maybe also in danger of getting lost as things become more homogenized. Um, I just drove uh, from Newburgh down to Florida to the Atlantic Center for the Arts where I was do with Suzanne actually. Uh, Suzanne and I were doing, it was sort of a combination of a residency and a, and a mentoring gig. And so, first of all, it was great to get out of the house and go on a road trip. I hadn't been on one for a long time. And, and I used to drive back and forth from Austin a lot too. And observing the way, um, you know, the land is so different as, as we drive someplace else, but it's also becoming so homogenized. Like there's always gonna be a BJ's and a Sam's Club and a Sunoco station and, and um, everything, the architecture is starting to look all alike and all of these, this, these mazes of parking lots that are being put up. And, uh, you know, what is still here to distinguish this place from the other places? And the ways, and, and it, I, I find that it almost always connects to um, verbal expression, the way that people are talking and, and, and using language and the way that people are thinking. It's, it's for me, it's um, intimately connected. And so what does that mean if we are foregoing diversity of language, if we are foregoing the diversity of the expression of the land? And, and, and if, we're, if we're not honoring diversity of species or of, of um, ethnicity or of race anymore. Um, and now uh, we, you know, we as a human species are, we're in big, big trouble. And um, how, how do we get out of this? And, and I kind of feel like one of, one of the ways for me, cause I'm like, I don't know what, I don't know what I can do but is to use my imagination and use my intuition as a way of learning and uh, not just looking at uh, human linear human logic and or or the or the structures that we've inherited uh, from just like one or two generations before like how can we go back even farther to people whose names we don't remember anymore to people before the Roman Empire and like how do I um, how do I connect with those people and and the and those languages and those modes of thinking and those ideas of the sacred, um, in a way that uh, that can uh, exist right now in in this moment that we're in. So I don't know. It's like a constant questioning. It's a it's a constant state of not knowing. Um, and so, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, even as a teacher, I'm always saying like, please don't listen to me because I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm exploring. And so, you know, if you are interested in exploring, then we'll just, we'll work from there. But uh, always we're trying to work from a place of not knowing and, but associating and, and sort of trying to put things together um, in a way that doesn't always make sense at first. And maybe uh, the, the sense of it arrives, makes itself known later. Tell me a bit more. I mean, I could sense when you said the time Black Lives Matter and the time of Corona, and then said things have changed for me deeply. Tell me a bit about that moment or what has changed? What is different? What will you do differently? Let's pretend they, everything will work out and in place. So what, what's, what's different? Yeah, I think questioning language like or the questioning written word anyway is it is uh it, it, it is part of that and also um questioning uh power like uh like what you were saying before the first and the firing line or whatever and and I I do I'm always like you know playing this persecution card a little bit with myself and I love to like sometimes especially when I'm tired like feel sorry for myself that, you know, I'm not having commercial success. <laughs> it's like, well, then you're not playing by the rules, you know, so you can or whatever. I can, I can get into, you know, the, um, the starving artist um, mode of thinking, feeling powerless, feeling like I'm always scrambling and, and uh, always uh, the underdog. And so uh, for me, when, when the Black Lives Matter uprising happened, and I've talked to a lot of other uh, white people that this happened to, it was like suddenly more visible how much power I actually have, that I, that I haven't been uh, even uh, cognizant of. And so uh, that's, that's, a big, that's a big change, you know, saying, well, I, I, 
you know, I, there's nothing I can do. I have nothing to do with it. It's not my fault. And yet I'm participating in, in these systems that, yeah, they were handed down to me, but um, each generation has a chance to change it. And so I think the shift was really internal and it was just about, um, it is just about perspective that it's like, oh, I, you know, it's, I, I don't always have money for the groceries that I want, but I do manage to come up like I'm not starving. And so there's a big difference between that and what a lot of people have been going through during this time. And so really acknowledging that and, um, and uh, letting go of this poverty mentality of like the starving artist, which is, uh, I don't think it's true. It, it became quite apparent to me that it's, it's, it's not true. It's a story I've been telling myself. Um, and, and it has to do with like comparing myself or my situation to stuff that doesn't have anything, that doesn't have anything to do with me. And so um, I do have space to make room for others and to share. I do have enough to share. And uh, before that, I was really like in this place of like always clenching and clutching and, um, and uh, fighting. And I wasn't even like aware of it. And actually, and, and the only time where I feel like there's a flow is when I get into a creative flow. But I started to realize the flow, the creative flow is through our whole lives. It's through our whole existence. It's um, it's like, where do I get gas? Where do I, where do I grocery shop? What do I choose to get at the grocery store? Um, how do I choose to participate in, in the systems? And so it's really just a change of perspective as far as what I'm going to do. I don't know. I I'm just continuing to make work and to, keep that perspective in my consciousness as much as possible and to look for the ways where something is coming into my awareness that hasn't been in my awareness as of yet or, um, or, or hasn't been a part of my direct um, experience so that I'm actually, whatever I'm doing is in response. It just, as long, as, long as I can keep it there and, and like keep the open question and, and the quality of not really knowing or understanding what I'm doing or what's going on and yet continuing to be responsible in that uh, I'm responding directly to it. Um, you know, and, and donating, like realizing, hey, I do have 25 extra bucks I could donate to this cause, you know, to these people who are out in the streets um, or, or to say, you know what, I can go to that protest. I do have time to go there. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, for me, it was just, um, this new awareness and and like um, a rejection of an old narrative that 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 isn't me. If it was ever true, it, it's not true to me anymore. Mm. Yeah, no, really. Thank you, thank you for for um, for sharing. Um, Do you do you see yourself uh, as a as a as a New York artist? Is that you know? Is that um, well, now you move there or how? What? How do you define yourself now? And I don't know. And being out there, I don't know. I'm trying to figure that out, and I'm also not trying to figure it out. I'm just like making with what I have, and. I'm noticing that a lot of the artists that I work with are also not in New York City. You know, I just made a piece with people who are all, I'm working with people who are all over the country who are overseas and um, the composer Paul Castles that I'm working with is in Sydney, Australia. So we're, you know, we're, we're uh, just, we're like a crisp, uh, a crepuscular collaboration. We, we speak early in the morning or late at night. It's always one or the other for, the, for one of us. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry that I left New York but I'm also not, I, I couldn't keep it going. I couldn't, um, I, uh, the quality of life was getting to be, it just felt too pinched. Like it was too much for my nervous system. What I had to do to just get like basic stuff done to get from point A to point B um, became really, really harder and harder. And, um, and to, uh, be in connection with nature. I think you still can in New York. I don't think it's impossible, but I, I have noticed like 
when I have a meeting and I say, why don't you get on the, why don't you get on the Metro North and come up here and we'll have the meeting. It's like such a relief for people. And so when I see that, I, I know that I've, uh, the move I've made is the right move physically. And that I do still, that still is my community. Um, I still really feel a part of that community and that community is spreading out more, I think. And, um, and also, you know, I, I was like really in disaster mode at the beginning, like last March, I thought, well, it's all going down. Like next thing that's going to go down is the internet. And so, you know, which didn't, it hasn't happened. And, and, uh, you know, we really have made the most of it, I think, in this last year uh, of, of this internet thing that we have, have invented in our human wiliness. Um, but I, you know, I was looking around, like, who are my neighbors? Like, if it does go down, I know that I'm still going to be making theater. Like, I, I'll probably never, I've been doing it since I was like a little kid. I'll probably not ever stop doing it. But like, who's going to be my audience then? It's going to change. You know, there's people with a Trump flag living down the road from me at the, at the time when I was living up in the Casco. And, you know, they're going to be in my audience. And those folks aren't going to be in my audience, you know, most likely um, at the Siegel Center. And there's all different kinds of people all over the place um, if, we're, if, we're, if we're talking about localizing. And so that could still happen, that could still change. And so then it's like, how do we adjust our work to, to like include whoever is around in, in the community? So, so I don't know, you know, I'm really, uh, I, I do feel, I've always been like really suspicious of the internet and I still feel that way, but, um, I feel like there's, there's been a lot of opportunity this year through the internet, through having that, and, uh, and also through teaching, which has become really, really important to me this year. I teach um, at Sarah Lawrence College, and I also teach through my company. I do mentoring and creative, like, consultation through my, through my company, and, and um, sort of helping if I can, people to feel liberated creatively. Like this is a time where we can be making stuff, you know, nothing matters, Every, all bets are off. Like what can we, what can we manage to accomplish in this time? What do we always long to do? And for me, it's like visual stuff, drawing and um, sewing and collaging. I love to do that stuff and there's never any time or there hasn't been, I thought, well, now's the time for me to, you know, explore that and try something that I'm not good at, but uh, to bring it into my work anyway, even though I'm not good at it. And, uh, and because it seemed to become about something else uh, other than, you know, being like a gladiator. I'm sorry, I keep bringing the Roman Empire. No, 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 on it's, train, it's on your mind. And uh, yeah. certainly these are times of uh, yeah. also an empire falling, you know, so and, and what makes an empire and what's what about the destruction? It's on all of our minds. I remember you once said that, you know, when you were a kid, you know, you already forced people in your family, sit down, I'm going to show you something, you know, yeah. you that you, you did all that and you just said that too. And so why do you, instead of being a journalist or being a school teacher or um, whatever you could have done with your brilliant mind at work in science, why, why, why do you do art? What do you believe in? Why is that important? I think that things are not as simple as like when I read the news, I'm like, it's not that simple. Any news story that I read, it's rare for me to read a news story where I'm like, oh, I feel like all the perspectives are represented here, you know? So, and like, what's the perspective of the unknown? What's the perspective of the inanimate? Like, how do we get to that? And uh, how do we, like, what's the way that we can speak about reality that contains all the layers of reality, even the ones that we don't know or understand. And I feel like um, to be a journalist or an academician, you've got to be able to wield a certain degree of expertise, even to be a theater artist in a lot of places, like you better know what you're talking about. And um, I just don't feel qualified to like <laughs> take that stance. And um, and I think things are really complicated and there's so much more complicated and to wrestle with uh, reality, like what are the jobs where we get to acknowledge really how complicated things are and to continue to question and to not know what we're talking about. And, I, and um, so this is, this is the way that I found it. And it's like, um, 
for me, I think it's a, that, okay, I'm going to put on a show, whatever that impulse was as a child. It was for me about um, changing the changing the atmosphere in the room to a place where uh, um, it just sort of open, open things up. Cause it always seemed like there was stuff going on that people weren't talking about. Like the, there was always stuff in the air that the adults weren't acknowledging, at least to me. And, uh, or, or they would um, beat around the bush. They didn't want to say things directly. And so it, it was just sort of a way to, um, uh, open up a like a like set up a table for for communication with with like what's not being talked about what are we not paying attention to what's what's the stuff if we're looking at it we're not supposed to be looking at it um and what what are like where is the mind going what are we not acknowledging what are we thinking about but not acknowledging and I was always questioning reality. There always seemed to be these sort of tears in reality uh, when I was a kid that nobody was talking about the indiscrepancies and inconsistencies. And that sort of made up the situation that I was always in. And, and so there was something about performing that, um, I don't know, it sort of lightened things up or, or it made it possible for all of that to, to exist for there to be uncertainty and for that to be celebrated and um, and yeah, I guess just celebrated. So yeah, I just never, I never stopped doing it. it. It's like a way for me to relate to the world that I can't find otherwise. It's really hard for me to um, even talking like this is, 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 is um, you know, if you were a stranger, if I didn't already know you and have a bunch of conversations um, in our history, it would be really hard for me to talk like this, you know, but it's easy for me to like put on a wig and get a microphone and like, watch this, you know, here's, here's how I feel about <laughs> whatever, whatever this situation is like, that's, and it's um, irrational. It's not rational. It's not science. You know, there's no uh, method to it. Um, it's not Stanislavski, or at least not the early Stanislavski, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't add up. It's not a plus B equals C. And for me, like I was always really bad at uh, the arithmetic of math because it just, it's like, that's, it's not that simple. <laughs> you know, I remember like reading, I think Carl Jung saying like he had so much trouble with algebra because he would be like, but why X? Like, why are you choosing X to represent that number? And they're like, well, it doesn't matter. It could be any number, but it's not, it's X. Why is it X? And I feel like I am totally stuck there still uh, questioning why X, why A, why is it, you know? Why is it? And then you make, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sync. And then this idea of synchronicity, all of a sudden you look at something and then things connect, you know? He yeah. says, I'm writing about synchronicity and I'm writing about fish all of a sudden. I see if dead fish uh, someone is called yeah. after a fish whatever you make connection create yes. a universe yeah. and this was also his belief since you are now looking at astrologies that mankind came up with belief systems whether they are the greek gods in our head there's a zeus and there's a palace athena and uh, and we all have to honor them you don't honor one of them you're in trouble also as a person yeah, you know and yeah, 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 and yeah. he said you know in astrology or the uh, tarot cards you know they offer a system to relate and um, and perhaps that's also in a way what you do and patterns you know patterns, like what yeah. are the patterns what are the um you know what are the patterns right now what could i be reading of reality like it doesn't have to be tarot cards it doesn't have to be um the the constellations even though that's a great way to you know i mean animals i i was met this biologist a couple years ago and he was he was studying dung beetles and he was like they migrate according to the constellations and it's like what and i was also just reading an article earlier this morning about spiders and that they they don't just think in a brain they that the their webs are their thoughts and it's like what how are we not how are we just using like human linear logic when there's so much else available to us? There's so many different mm -hmm. patterns and yeah, synchronous. I work with synchronicity all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes, it makes the world so much more meaningful. And um, I feel like the arts are one of the only places in our culture where 
we have the opportunity to build a framework to contain all of that stuff and to express all that stuff and to work with the images that come into our minds for reasons that we don't, you know, we're so, oh, well, that's just your imagination. We dismiss the imagination. But in my experience, I've come to learn that the human imagination is really powerful. And that one of the reasons why we're in so much trouble is that we don't acknowledge its power enough and that we don't have a framework for the activities of our imagination, um, of our consciousness to connect with the world around us, that we, mm -hmm. we have this like Cartesian separation. And I, if we don't let go of that soon, I, I think it's going to be, I really think it's going to be over for us. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, you know, um, trying to uh, stay, stay true to that from whatever my position happens to be that I'm learning all anew mm -hmm. over and over again each day to stay connected with what is my, what is my imagination presenting to me today and how can I um, sort of pay homage to it? Yeah, and in a way, as you say, to stay in between, it's going to be over. But you say, no, I'm going to do something against, against that. What you said about you, what you read this morning. So, what what inspired you? What were you listening to, or seeing, or reading in that time? What what kept your motor running? Um, it was really interesting. It was a lot for me about relationship uh, to other people. Um, which I think that was part of what I was talking about before uh, about getting enough solitude allowed me to connect with the people in my life more. And it was like this weird contradiction, but um, like the people in my company and making work with them and just feeling the, um, uh, the sort of amoebic solidarity of that, of that group and um, the amazing moment of like having a Zoom rehearsal and saying, oh, we got it, you know, the same old thing. How are we going to get this done? How are we going to get this done? And having everybody say, oh, I have time. <laughs> I have time to do that. This was at the beginning because then there was a time where everybody got really busy. Um, and so, yeah, connecting with the people that I work with and um, love. Yeah. It's emotional, but um, yeah, I felt like before this, I didn't know what love was. But it, I, I know now, and it's, it's what's um, motivating me. And so that's a, that's a huge change. I mean, maybe that was true before, but I wasn't um, I wasn't paying attention enough. And so um, I remember having like a rehearsal, and and we have all these habits where we're like, I'm sorry, I'm late, or um, I'll get that to you as soon as I can. You know, there's always we're always like in this emergency mode making theater. And I said, you know what, like everything's crumbling. There's no more success to chase. There's no more institutional um, approval to have to um, be competing for. It's over, at least, you know, for the moment. This is for us. So we have to make this peace. We have to get out of it what we want and help one another, you know, to, to achieve that. And so if we have to let go of uh, ideas of excellence or, um, you know, whatever we're always striving for that always seems to be out of reach, it's very American, very Western probably, um, you know, this has to be about something else. It has to be a healing experience to be making right now. Um, and so whatever, however that's going to manifest, like we've got to take care of each other. We've got to take care of ourselves. And it's changed everything about the way that I'm working and the way that I'm communicating with people and even setting up schedules or making budgets or um, uh, assuming responsibility for. 
uh, and it's changing all the time. It's, it's growing. And now, you know, things are starting to open back up and, you know, we're getting back to normal. We're getting back to normal. I'm like, yeah, but what is that now? Hasn't that changed? Like, aren't we in a different place? And, you know, when are we going to start talking about booster shots? Like, no, aren't we supposed to be getting booster shots soon? Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, trying to go toward this opening back up in a, in a conscious, in a conscious way. And yeah, we were really lucky. Like these vaccines came out and in the U S anyway, like we're, we're sitting pretty at the moment, but that's a big at the moment for me. And, uh, and what about the rest of the world and what about in the fall and winter? And so, uh, how are we going to continue making work? Cause for me, it just is never going to be the same again. I hope, I hope it'll never be the same again. I don't feel like the same person. Um, and I, I I've heard a lot of people saying that also. Yeah, that is, um, that is, um, it is a real moment, a time of change and, you know, one, as painful as it is also then for you and what 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 a what a great gift also then to realize something you know speaking about love and that's what it ultimately is about something so simple and we know it but we as you said might not might not realize it don't really really thank you for um for um you know for being so honest and 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 um sharing and uh and reminding us you know what this time can also do and what it could be good for and and that we're still in the uncertainty and we do not know many say you know this is a dress rehearsal for catastrophic environmental catastrophes you know yeah. that are just around the corner we don't know we should not screw this up we have to take it serious we have to learn we have to change the way we are and our artists if we don't do it who else well we as you say we have some power we can you know it was in imagination so um that's quite um quite very very powerful what you what you shared who did you in, in in your way of creating work and making work who did you look up to who influenced you who uh, who made you who you are uh, <clears throat> i really always have to thank mac wellman um i don't think that i would have continued uh I, his, his work always meant so much to me because he was so uh, free and he didn't, he didn't ask permission. He sort of had this um, interior permission. I don't know where he got it from, but he was able to extend that to so many other artists through his, through his work and his teaching. Uh, so he's like, for me, like number one, uh, inspiration. Uh, and I also really always loved uh, Jim Strauss, who's no longer with us. I always just loved his writing. I, I had the chance to encounter it pretty early on before I started writing myself, I think. And, um, and he just, he was just so great. Uh, so, and um Tom Murren also, who's also no longer with us. Um, and he's like crazy. I remember the first time seeing his performances and, and being like, what? Like, and people were rolling, laughing. And I was like, what, this is crazy. What is he, he would just make, all, he would make all of these props just to make one simple point, like this really elaborate prop and, and, and it would all fold up in a sheet at the end and he would, he would walk off the stage and um, just so ridiculous and so committed um, to ridiculousness. Um, and I think also of Lucille Ball, I was sort of raised a little bit by like Lucille Ball and Linda Carter as Wonder Woman. Like those were, those were like really, I just spent a lot of time with both of them as a kid and just watching how they uh, operated and, um, and so, and then also like as a, as a performer working with all the, uh, all the different groups over the years, um, and just being in that, uh, community and, and being like, let's go see 
what so-and-so is bringing to the table. And, and a lot of that was uh, before, before the internet. I was watching a video of, of one of my first things that I ever did, like not so long ago, that it was on VHS, uh, that Tableau, thank God, put on it. He digitized it for me. And I was listening to the audience and how they're really listening and so engaged. Do you, have you noticed this, Frank? You're nodding. And it's so, mm-hmm. I, there was yeah. a different kind of presence that the audience had before the internet. Uh, and so just being really inspired by that and, and Little Theater and Dixon Place. Um, Little Theater, when it, it's, at, it's at Dixon Place now, but it used to be at Tonic and it was this great bar and I, I don't know, there just was, and everyone lived closer together. Like people weren't like all the way out in Queens somewhere. It was easier to sort of gather. Um, the people who were working in downtown theater lived downtown. Like that's why yeah. they called it downtown. That's why they were doing stuff there. And um, there were, you know, all these venues like that place, Nada, uh, that Aaron, that guy Aaron had, and he, he like, bought those places with on his credit card you know it was so it was on the lower east side these places were just so cheap and there's just so much going on and so that energy was always 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 really inspiring to me and anytime somebody would get up and just throw down like oh watch this like judy elkin um her performances were always so mystifying to me and and inspiring like oh you can really just do whatever you want (laughs) you know um and so that was always um, like getting getting to getting to the city as as a young person, and you know, it was like coming into a new frog pond and going around and, and seeing what was what was going on. It was a new universe uh, to explore. And Kristen Cosmos is mm-hmm. is like always so super inspiring to me. Uh, even just talking with her, I used to I lived with her for a little while. We were roommates and. Uh, there were just some of the most inspiring conversations of my life uh, at that kitchen table. And, uh, and I'm really inspired by Suzanne Bocanegra's work um, and a lot of the choreographers and visual artists too. I, I just, um, I find Sarah Mitchelson's work to be really, really inspiring. And, um, and Kate Valk, watching Kate Valk work is just always like such a gift. I feel like if I, ever have grandchildren, I'll, I'll tell them I saw Kate Vall perform as many times as I did. And, um, and uh, I worked with Mike Iveson a bunch and I, he just really, really always, always, always inspires me with the way that he looks at the world. And I, uh, I love when he was there, there was a period of time, it was like a two year or one year span of time, maybe six or seven years ago where people started giving him awards like and now you got to make your own shows and he made these two shows and they were wonderful um and I I hope that he'll he'll start doing that again and and I just I love I love the way he sees things and and how he expresses and what a great um appreciator he is and uh, the, his, his formal thought. And I have to say, Frank, I always am inspired at the Siegel Center. Anytime oh. I come and see something there, mm. I'm always, and, and talking with you and hearing you talk and watching the way that you observe and, and, and how you're sort of curating and, um, and even like visiting your office and, and seeing all the energy there and the way that you work. I miss coming over there for, you know, this reason or that and seeing, you know, the way things are, are working over there. Thank um, you, thank you. That really, yeah. that means a lot to me. Yeah, you've done because it comes work. from you and uh, I know you, you mean that. Um, if you could, I mean, we come in closer um, 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 to the end, you know, um, I tell us a bit what, what are upcoming projects, but also if someone, would say, let's give that starving artist what she wants. What would, <laughs> what would you do? Oh, I really, um, yeah, I, I really want to do more site specific stuff, like going to the places and like spending time there and making a piece that's based on the place and then performing it at the place, like doing a whole process and, uh, and being allowed to have it take years 
for all of the patterns to reveal themselves and all the connections to be made. Cause I'm realizing like, it does take years. And I've made pieces in the past where they don't mean anything until, until later. And then I look back and I'm like, Oh, Oh, of course that's, you know, um, and, and that's the risk, I guess, of, of like working in an intuitive way and like, you know, trying to tune in with natural, like the natural patterns in, in our surroundings and in our minds. Um, I just, I think that would be, uh, that would be ideal. I love to travel, but I like to stay in a place or return to a place several times and, uh, really get the feel of it and, and, and say, well, what's, what's here? What are all the layers here? And sort of responding to that, uh, in, in irrational way, which is a creative way and to make in response to whatever, I, I, I find there um, and to, you know, gather new collaborators and bring in other collaborators and sort of just making uh, like an alchemical creation based on, based on all the different places, all like the really charged magical places that there are in this world. And um, going back to add layers into narratives that are ancient narratives, but um, like I always think about Wagner's ring cycle and, and I love it and I love those stories and I feel like there's so much more there that he didn't tell. I'd love to go back and like get under the hood of that thing and, and, and bring out some of the uh, more animist worldviews hidden in that stuff and, um, you know, have an opportunity for new collaboration and old collaboration to mm -hmm. um, inform that. Amazing. Yeah. So if anybody is listening, Sybil yeah. would do the ring cycle. Um, um, you know, Julie Tamer, list. she was asked as a, you know, downtown puppeteer theater maker and she came up with the Lion King. And uh, and so it would be interesting to see, you know, how how you would wrestle with that. And I think it would be uh, interesting and significant and and important. So yeah, so that's a big thing to, to look forward to. But maybe you will also find a Sybil Kempson way of staging the cycle it certainly would um you know get the attention it it, it deserves listen it was a fantastic uh, uh, so to have you uh, with oh. us and thank you really thank for you. taking this so serious and for really sharing you know and um, what you felt and what you experienced you know i think it was it came through as, as as real and true and you really went through something i wish we all can could say that what you say you know that we discovered what love is do you said you know that the company you work with comes first that is about exploring that it's no longer about success and institutions and um, and that the community matters and the places we haven't visited and also to stay in places and not do the kind of ghetto tourism visits of theater companies you play go away and right so or to return have, yeah return returning. to that so it's a lot of uh, what you have done always before you know already but what people talking about now what should be done and uh, so you really are um, um, guiding light also in this um, fog in a way which we are thrilled still going through so really really Really, thank you for uh, thank you. Uh, uh, sharing. And I know that you had to do a little arm twisting. You didn't want to do it, but I said, you know, uh, um, it is uh, important. And I think it proved that it really is. And it was a, a sort of signaling a bit through the flames from the trenches where you are in. And um, I think this is quite, quite an important and significant, you know, statements you made and very, very meaningful, as you said, also for students or people who, who are starting in that sphere to say, this is something, you know, that's, then that's real. And I, it was a great privilege to have you with us. Willie, really, thank you. I'll come up and visit you soon. And um, come up, friend. Uh, yeah, so I can uh, also see the movements of the leaves and maybe watch one leaf come coming on to the ground. Any okay. Time. Get on that train. Good. Thank and so all much. New Yorkers who know Sybil go up and visit her. So um, next week, we're going to continue. It will be the last week, you know, of Seattle Talks, um, uh, focusing on Corona. In some way, I think we will rethink it, but uh, we are coming uh, to a close. We're going to have Bettina Wagner Bergelt from the great Pina Bausch company. She runs the company and she will tell what it means, you know, to go on after also the passing of a Pina. Pina Bausch, uh, you know, it was a big absence, a big loss, uh, re, uh, reinventing, and then the, you know, uh, 
forced stop and where is the company going and the, also connected to a foundation as the Pinabon Foundation. So where are they going? What does that all mean? She was such a great artist who inspired them, all of us. And then we have the great Alec Duffy and Brian Rogers will come and talk about Jack and about the chocolate factory. The chocolate factory is moving, Alex moved and will be moving. So lots of things are happening I do not know enough about. So it will be great to hear from those two great uh, leaders um, in, 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 in our field what we watch at the uh, theater in New York. And then we have Francesc Casa de Jesus Calvo from uh, Barcelona, um, from the Festival Grec. And he will tell us um, in one of the great festivals in Europe how, how it's about to open, you know, how the situation is in Spain, what's through his mind, how he sees um, uh, what is of importance and what's necessary and um, what is the change and what does change mean? So um, thank you all listeners for, for staying with us and uh, another week. And, um, and it's important uh, uh, to hear from artists, but ultimately it's also, you know, for your life and in a way what Sybil says, you know, the connection to nature, to uh, moments in time, to engage with locations you are in, collaborating with the people who are really close to you. It all can be transferred in a symbolic way to our own lives and our lives will be better if we listen um, to our artists. And what she says, it's also to be taken serious that she says, I as an artist feel it might be the end of things are coming if we don't really change. And this is um, not just something she says casually, I think something she really means. And many, many people do think that. And so we cannot just go back to do some entertainment. It would be not truthful and would be a treason to the mission of art itself. So, but the big question is what do we do? And I think you have found some answers. So thanks you all for listening, taking the time. Thanks for HowlRound to stick with us again, Thea and Vijay, Andy Lerner from the Siegel Center and uh, Sybil. Uh, good luck with everything. And get, you can go back to your mad scientist lab where we see some glances there. And we can't <laughs> wait to uh, hear what comes out of there. And the ring cycle would be a great thing next okay. to you know, many others. It's okay, so you heard it here first. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, bye, Frank. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Release, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>